I'm in the business of wanting to resurrect that triumphant beast in you. Welcome to The Boundless Body, the podcast with the somatic doctor interviewing innovative thinkers about their perspectives relating to the arts and sciences of therapy. Discover The Boundless Body. Back to the mystery. Well, I'd like to welcome Layla Contractor on The Boundless Body. Welcome to The Boundless Body, Layla. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah. So excited to talk with you about drugs. Let's talk about drugs, shall we? <laughs> I said to let your <laughs> listeners in <laughs> easy. <laughs> I rebuffed the band. <laughs> well, we can kind of medicine. That always seems to be a useful reframe, right? Let's talk about medicine, Layla. How about that? We'll put the band aid back off. <laughs> To try, air it out at first and then put the container back on. Oh <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So just going to read your bio first and then we'll jump right in. All right. So Layla Contractor, MD, is an integrative child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist who recently gave a two-part lecture series at, at Cambridge Health Alliance affiliated uh, uh, affiliated with Harvard University. Her path to integrative medicine began when she turned to it herself after becoming extremely and unexplainably ill. Soon after embarking on her own healing journey, she was determined to provide the same integrative modalities for her own patients. She went on to do a fellowship in integrative psychiatry and psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and Dr. Gabor Mate's year-long Compassion Inquiry program. Today, she continues to expand her work by training and practicing with the latest available medicines and holistic approaches. Her areas of specialty include trauma, learning challenges, ADHD, autism, athletes, and post-injury recovery, ketamine, and other psychedelics. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just really interested in what we've been calling on the boundless body, the initiatory illness, um, <laughs> which so many of the, like. yeah, <laughs> initiatory il illness, which has an ancient <laughs> tradition tracing back to, you know, the shamanisms and so on, but also the founders of the psycho and the psychodynamic community, Freud and Jung and, you know, some of these, I mean, even Mesmer and stuff like that do tend to show this initiatory illness element. So wondering if you could tell our audience a little bit about what that was like for you, what happened, what catapulted you into psychedelics and, and, uh, and integrative medicine. I had actually, I have three children. I just finished breastfeeding my youngest. Actually, they told me I wouldn't even be able to have a third kid. It would have been impossible. I was perimenopause. Anyway, so I was done breastfeeding her and I abruptly went back into me perimenopause and it was pretty hellish. You know, being a psychiatrist, I looked at this as like, you know, I'm going to take some Prozac and Trazodone and call it a day. I felt I was feeling terrible. In hindsight, three weeks later, I started getting ill. I started developing right-sided weakness. I kept making excuses for it, dropping things, getting really slow at work, really foggy. And then eventually, April 2019, I started having what felt like ascending paralysis. So ascending weakness and paralysis and my respiratory muscles were affected. I called my boss. I was like, I don't know what's happening, but I'll probably be back in you know, a week or two. Like it should be. Anyways, I started my uh, journey. And so I went to multiple places. I went to uh, multiple institutions, um, actually across the country and yeah, because they could give me some labels yeah, like, you know, autonomic labels, neuropathy or pseudomotor neuropathy. And and yet most people were kind mm. of perplexed at the severity of the neuropsychiatric symptoms. So at one point, they kept telling people, I was like, I can't remember anything. I had notebooks in my cars, in my purse. I couldn't remember anything anyone told me. I had to pick up my kids at school. Finally, they did some nice testing that showed my verbal memory was in the less than first percentile. They told me I was just like a stressed out mom. I'm like, I used to manage way more than this. This is not just stress. Like, I cannot remember stuff. Um, eventually, they, you know, like anything else, they said it was autoimmune. Yeah, I posted my case on a physician mom group, which is like mommy group, which is like 40,000 plus group. 
and I followed every lead, everything anyone told me, I followed it, I did it. But I kept getting direct messages from integrated medicine physicians saying, you know, your case is really typical for what we see here. You're probably not going to find your answers in traditional medicine. You know, and eventually somebody connected me to one locally. I went to her. I thought it was like a bunch of crap. It was like, it's expensive. Said I had Lyme. I was like, mm-hmm. I don't have Lyme disease. Come on. And I grew up on the East Coast where I felt like people really had Lyme disease. Like, it's not just, but eventually I got so bad. I couldn't get out of bed. I would just stay in bed all day to save enough energy to be, my kids were all under the age of five or six at that point. And one of these physicians reached out to me and she's like, what are you doing? She's like, why won't you take that herbal supplement? And she's like, what's the worst that's going to happen? She's like, it really can't get worse than what's happening. So I went ahead, I took it and it halted the progression of my illness. And then I, it caught the attention. I went back to this integrative medicine doctor. Her name is Dr. Kelly McCann. She's phenomenal. I mean, and I said, look, I'm going to do one thing at a time, Dr. McCann. Throw one thing at me at a time. And also by then, I'd, also I knew I about how severe I my cognition it. issues were. And that really freaked me out because I was like, it's like, look, my body can go, but I lose my mind. I lose my, and I lose my ability to ever, in my mind, ever, you know, have a career. And so that really was... Yeah. Out of everything, even more than the respiratory stuff and everything, that was kind of the most worrisome to me. Integrative medicine solely, solely helped me get my way back. Amazing. Yeah. What was it that you took? That's funny. All I remember it is the acronym was like BLT. I should know. It saved my life. I have a bottle of it at home. (laughs) Yes, it Ba- bacon, lettuce, and tomato? tomato. That, they yeah, just the gave you a, a BLT. Oh, I know. Is that terrible? I should remember. I should have a little like... Uh... It's, it's all good. What it points to, though, is this really the gut-brain axis. Yeah, I mean, because you treat your gut, you treat your brain. Inflammation is the cornerstone now of so many mental health disorders. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so this was actually a tincture. So exactly... Um, and it, it was actually, it was meant for Lyme disease, actually. And so. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in Pennsylvania. I used to vacation mm-hmm. in Connecticut. So Connecticut. it's quite feasible. I, I truly have Lyme disease or have it still. Welcome to the Boundless Body Podcast, where we ask the simple and powerful question, what can a body do? I'm Dr. Brian Tierney. I'm a somatic psychologist, a neuroscience professor, and a specialist in trauma resolution. The Boundless Body Podcast is brought to you by BiTap, the creators of a powerful bilateral stimulation tool for nervous system regulation. I use this tapping technology clinically because it's a wonderful, gentle, pulsatile, tactile stimulation that helps the brain to regulate experience. And what I mean by regulate experience is not just managing the bad stuff, but amplifying the good stuff. So these tappers aren't just used clinically, they're used in many different settings, including with frontline workers, people that have test anxiety, kids and parents, teachers and school counselors, people in addiction recovery, restless sleepers, and people that are struggling with pain management and medical issues. So the benefits are vast. You can go to the BiTap website to get your tappers to help with your nervous system. And you can enter the Brian 10 code to get your discount. I hope you enjoy the show. Wow. So you came in as a skeptic about the, the Lyme, uh, yeah. the field of Lyme. You were like, as a physician, you were like, oh gosh, you know, like the, you know, if the traditional diagnosis. Plot, yeah elements yeah if if that isn't if that doesn't show any markers then like what are you all talking about like yeah doesn't make sense to me but then you got treated and i mean you so you were like numb your your arms were numb your what 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 was happening physiologically i got yeah that's yeah so what was happening is i was developing right sighted weakness which is actually still there it's obviously not as severe as um, I started having slurred speech. I started having mm. numbness and tingling in my arms. And then what started happening, you know, that the last day of, you know, that I was working is I actually started feeling my muscles get extremely weak and it seemed to go from my feet all the way up. 
at one point I had a pelvic exam and the practitioner was shocked. She's like, you have zero muscle tone, like none. And when I went for further testing, they showed that likely some sort of um, neuromuscular cause for my respiratory, um, but really my respiratory muscles were severely affected. So I couldn't actually, like for about a year and a half, I was probably using this much of my lungs to actually breathe. It was very difficult. Um, they thought, of course, I had ALS, which I went to multiple tests. I did not have ALS. And this severe, severe brain fog, like... I just, hmm. I really could not uh, function uh, very well at all. So it's both speaking, but especially a process, receptive language, listening, pro verbal processing. Yeah, was, so I was yeah. just extremely forgetful. So I had to start writing things down and processing in general too. Like even doing a family budget was just like, it would take me hours and hours to just label like fences, like, Honestly, like really simple, simple things. It was during the, this postpartum era. Yeah. Like it, it, when did it first start? It was like right after birth or? No. So I actually, I, actually, I no. am, my youngest was globally delayed, which is uh -huh. a whole experience in itself. She was receiving services from the state. So I breastfed her for 29 months. It's like, I know that research. You're a hero. You're a hero. <laughs> Meanwhile, completely <laughs> depleting my body, right? Like, and so I stopped breastfeeding her around 21 months. <clears throat> and I was okay for about a week. And then a week later, I just was like irritable, couldn't sleep. I was having hot flashes, night sweats. I was having palpitations. Of course, providers were kept telling me it was all in my head. Anyways, and it was finally my my male OB. He's like, you're like in full blown perimenopause. He's like, you just need some hormones, and you're gonna feel better. And sure enough, I did. Um, but I got a lot. I mean, during this time, I got a lot of experience on the other side of medicine of how quite people were. My first neurologist actually said there was nothing wrong with me, and I actually lost my medical disability, which is really difficult for our family. I mean, it took me wow. months to get it back. I was like, I can't work. I can't go. I can't even get out of bed. How am I? Just because you can't find what's wrong doesn't mean there isn't something wrong. But yeah, so sorry, was answer that your question. Yeah. It was like uh -huh. around the postpartum, I guess if you want to extend it, postpartum period. Yeah. The, the so-called fourth trimester. <laughs> My, which is very uh, extended so for me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So at about this two year mark is when you started to get these symptoms. Right. Pretty much two after years I, post birth. Yeah. yeah. As soon as yeah. I stopped breastfeeding, breastfeeding hormonally, I'm trying to think about two months later, then I mm. finally started the Prozac and the Trazodone because I was like, I, I need to sleep. I was like, I'm about to like, everybody's pissing me off. Like, I'm irritable as hell. It's like, um, and then it was about three weeks yeah. after starting that, that I started developing the weakness, but didn't put two and two. I kept thinking, oh, it's ergonomic. It's how I'm sitting at work, but it wasn't that. Well, plus you have a developmentally challenged child. Yeah. You, you know, you had that intensity to that. I don't know if it gets talked about enough about how how intense that is, how, how big of a deal that is to have some, a developmental challenge in the family. Yeah. You know, you're right. And I think being a child psychiatrist, I mean, I just didn't care. Like I didn't care. Meaning like I threw everything in the kitchen sink. Like I knew how crucial it was, um, for me the early intervention. The early so she intervention. got everything. I mean, she, she was in PT, uh, physical therapy, she's in occupational therapy, she's in speech therapy. Um, she had phenomenal services, actually, honestly, from the state, which were group therapies twice a week. I mean, I did everything and it just, it didn't matter. I was like, I, I am going to make sure that this, you know, girl has a, you know, fighting chance. But I think that really it's interesting, just to start, I started getting some signs that she was probably going to be like overall okay. My body started decompensating. So I think I was waiting for that message. I see. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
And how's she doing now? Oh, she's great. She goes to, uh, I mean, this was a kid I thought she was going to be in a specialized school and possibly the rest of her life. She's in public school. She has dyslexia, but that's kind of the least of my worries. I have dyslexia, so it's not shocking. Unfortunately, all three of my kids have it too. But she's doing yeah. amazing. So the early intervention, I do early reward. Oh my gosh. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And at, at what point was she on the spectrum? The question I'm going to is like, when did you start kind of specializing in autism, autism spectrum disorders? So she was not on the spectrum. Actually, she was just uh-huh. literally globally delayed in every area, physically, yeah. speech, mentally as well. Mm-hmm. I had a very dear family very member dear. who is on the spectrum. I knew something was wrong from the beginning, uh, meaning when uh, pretty much from the get-go, meaning from when the time they were born. And I kept ta- taking them places, you know, people, teachers, everyone kept poo-pooing, right? Like, they're like, no, no, you know, you know, and of course, being a child psychiatrist, everyone just thought I was like, the, you know, kind of hypervigilant. But eventually, I had to take her to B.J. Freeman, who helped write the original diagnosis for autism. And I learned very quickly that even despite my own training, which is trained in very much a male model of what autism looks like and the female, I call it the female phenotype, is it's a completely different beast. It presents differently. It acts different. Everything is different about it. Um, and so I think because of that experience, because of all um, the services and everything, it's, it's kind of, I, mean, I think I just, you know, I... Even when people don't say they're on the spectrum and they walk in my office, it's just, I can identify it now. So it has become a specialty and it's become an area I'm really passionate about. So I have a lot of female young adults on the spectrum too, because they, of course, you know, they get, females just get diagnosed much later, unfortunately. Could you touch on some of the differences in the female expression of Autism spectrum disorders versus versus male. Yes. So, mm. and I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about it in a way that I was, you know, in my discussions with BJ Freeman and other people. So I, I don't mean for it to be pathologizing or in any type of way. But females tend to present more like neurotypical males. Yeah. In that. They will make eye contact, especially with family, right? So with known survivors, people who they see uh, every day. So this kind of notion of it, they won't make any eye contact. They don't necessarily line up toys like they used to. They may kind of play with them. And and so that's tricky, too, because in a traditional diagnosis, oh, they're lining up toys. They're not playing with them. In the case of this particular family member, she just wanted to go out and play every day. That's all she wanted to do, like. So she was playing on swing sets and stuff, but in hindsight now, she truly wasn't playing with any of the toys, you know, that were around. (laughs) They're actually amazing at what we call masking. So girls on the spectrum tend to have some sort of inkling that something may not be right, but they're not exactly sure what that something is. And so they're amazing at studying other people and learning. But they still kind of miss the mark social, but they will study. So some of these girls look like they're quiet, like followers. But what they're doing is they're actually looking, studying people and looking for cues. And so it becomes um, tricky. There's a really beautiful YouTube video. I am blanking on the girl's name, but she talked about... She first took one of the diagnostic assessments for autism, which is the ADOS, but she got like a zero. She's like, I learned that this is how you like do well in tests. So she's like, I, she somehow figured out like how she was supposed to answer. Probably because she was, you know, studying, astute, looking at social interactions. And she got a zero. She got a zero. being on. So girls are, are tricky um, that way. And a lot of their hyper-focus tends to be gen- can be gender specific. So nobody can say, oh, she likes dolls. Big deal, right? And they may not have that monotonic, mono, mono, monotone in their speech. So really, they honestly present quite 
differently. And sometimes they may do okay until elementary school where people have a lot of grace. And then where I see them really struggling often is middle school when social interaction becomes much more nuanced. People don't mean what they say. Flashes come in the way. <laughs> social interaction becomes much more complicated. Thank you for that. What was the bridge for you into psychedelics? What, oh. what got you interested in psychedelics? So along my path, while well, I was sitting there getting IVIG treatment for my autoimmune issue, and I was actually responding to it. I was sitting there and I was really, I mean, you're there for hours at a time. It's, a, it's like five to six hours a day for a week, once a month. So a lot of time to think. Sitting there, yeah. and I was like, I wonder if it's my antidepressant that's making me sick. That's like, at that point, that was kind of the only medicine I was on. So I stopped taking it. That was horribly suicidal. But my physical symptoms started improving. And so I was like, oh, my God, this is this is what started it. Um, so I still kind of laugh. I think it's kind of some dark humor that I'm a psychiatrist. Because they never take an antidepressant, ever. <laughs> I've retried on occasions, and I get just as sick rather quickly. And so I had to slowly come off the medicine, which don't let anyone ever tell you discontinuation syndrome doesn't exist. Because it does. It was horrific. Yeah. Yeah. I was really suicidal for quite some time. And I knew, I knew it was just, these are just thoughts, and I had no intention, but it was... That's just how bad I felt. I pretty quickly was thrown into some pretty severe, complex PTSD, what I'd been kind of avoiding my whole life and didn't actually know, to be fair, it's just, I mean, some of the stories I'd hear from my patients, I'm like, wow, I, I, I had it good. I have, I've always had it good. In my integrative psychiatry program, after Grabar Mate was lecturing, I raised my hand because I, I just do that. And in 15 minutes, he nailed, he nailed everything. I was like, how is it like, I've been in and out of therapy most of my life. And this guy, 15 minutes, like really. So he told me to read the book when the body says no. And then he's like, call me. Like, you're done reading it. Anyways, so I did. I actually by then you know, signed up for his course. And then I was a groupie. So he's taking his workshops at Eating's course. And when the workshops, he talked about, like, oh, he's like, I'm going to be in Sandy. I'm like. Great. In my backyard, didn't Great. know what the workshop was about. And I went, well, it was on psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And I'm someone, honestly, I used to, I used to drink alcohol, never did any psychedelics, probably did even like a handful of times, if that. Like, it's just not, this is not my background. Um, and as I was sitting there and I was looking at the research, and we, there was Phil Wolfson was there, Gabor Mate was there, Bessel van der Kolk was there. Richard Schwartz was there. She the woman, and I'm blanking on it. I'm so sorry. She's, she's at the time was the head of CIIS. She was there. Huh. And I was like, mm. how is yeah. supposed trauma psychiatrist? And I don't know this stuff existed. Mm. And anyways, I mean, I think I was just desperate mm. enough. And it's like, I'm, I'm going to try this. This is what I'm going to do to help myself. So th that's, <laughs> it was really the evidence. Really? I mean, I still consider myself like a scientist, right? Show me the evidence. Even in innovative psychiatry, show me the evidence. I'll use something that's alternative and different, but I need to see some of the evidence if this is what this would work and why it would work. And so that's what really sold me on it. That 15 minutes with Gabor Mate must have been just like, I'm a researcher of the tingling response, the involuntary pilo erection response, the uh, goosebumps. The goosebumps. Yeah. 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 Uh, the goosebumps, yeah. And uh, I often think that epiphany moments or big aha moments, it's accompanied by this tingling response. You, does that clock for you? you? You know what? I don't remember if I had that response. I will tell mm -hmm. you that I do get that response get and it's 100%. And I sometimes don't always understand why, like if I'm listening to a song. Yeah. And that comes on. Yeah. I now, understanding more of my ancestral trauma, understanding more about various things, I now understand those responses. And I know I've, 
even prior to meeting Gabby, I had actually gotten a lot into Judith Orloff's work. And she talks a lot about this, like being an empath. And like, I'm trying to think, she was interviewing this famous singer. And he's, he's like, it's all about the goosebumps. Like, I, I follow my goosebumps. And since <laughs> Me too. I'm with that guy, whoever he is. I do. I, I wish I could remember him, but it was somebody that, anyway, she, um, yeah, interviewed, but um, sometimes it's yeah. better when it's uh, when like the the teacher uh, it left unnamed. You know, like somebody no, no, once said is, that the best. Yeah, no, this <laughs> is the tip of the tongue phenomenon <laughs> menopause. Now I ah, totally okay. have it. Like I used to be, I used to be sharp for this. I can, sharp. I remember hearing her talk about it. I wrote him. I feel like I can see his face. I can't yeah. remember his name. Yeah. What do you remember about, like, what was it about that 15 minute speech that just nailed all of it for you? Do you, what, what was the core of the message there? It's kind of the myth of the happy childhood, right? Like I get, I mean, first of all, I see children, right? I get so many people who come in and it's the subtleties of neglect, right? Neglect hmm. is death by, a, like, I call it death by a thousand right? It is so subtle and so, so insidious. And I say this with a lot of humility. You know, my parents were first generation immigrants. They had come from India. I mean, I really, I really believe, you know, today that they were honestly doing the best that they could. And yet we were probably a bit of a mismatch. Because <laughs> like, you know, parent child diets are concerned. Hmm. And so he nailed that for me. And again, I, I honestly hmm. say, like, it was not even something I was aware of. And I continue to see that patients, it's very hard to kind of, quote unquote, convince people of this neglect, especially when you had all your other needs met, right? Like, I wasn't starving. I had a house over my head. My parents really sacrificed everything for my education, for my medical schooling. Kind of an unheard of thing, right? Like, they really did everything really did to set me up set on a path me. of success. So there's this yes. like, yeah, you know, I recently had a patient come in and she's patient. like, I feel bad even saying it because I love my parents. And if I feel like mm. if I say this, I won't, I'm not honoring them or not loving them, you know? So I think people mm. really struggle. And again, Gabor talks about, you don't know what you never had. You don't have a frame of reference for what you were mm. supposed to have or get. And so that's what he really, I thought in a very, I mean, some people I think don't like the style, but I think I was just ready for anything. I was so desperate. I was in the throes of complex PTSD and I was just desperate for help. So I was really open to whatever would make sense and that could be helpful for me. What did you call it? Death of a thousand what? Death by a thousand paper cuts, right? It's like. Death it's, by a thousand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Again, it's not that, you know, yeah. anything horrific happened or that you had ongoing horrific incidences. But, you know, we have mirror neurons, right? Like, and the, the point of the mirror neurons is to have an available person, whether it's your parent, partner, friends, rear you back and validate you and turn this on. And largely mm -hmm. that doesn't happen. And it's a very hard thing to put your finger on because other needs mm -hmm. often can be. Mm -hmm. And that's what I tend to see yeah. with a lot of people with this chronic depression that we can. And again, I'm not downplaying that there are genetic components. Like in our, in one side of my family, when we go down, we go down hard. I mean, I've had uh, three family members who've needed EC, you know, electric compulsive therapy. So I'm not downplaying genetic loading. What we see as, you know, treatment-resistant depression, I think we're missing the mark. I actually think it's it's trauma, and our medicines were never meant to fix trauma. And, you know, the studies show that. The studies show, and that's kind of like the dirty secret in psychiatry, right? Like, I, I work in a nonprofit for vets, and I think this is the unfortunate thing we've sold them is that somehow putting them on all these medicines is going to do something. And it can, it can turn the volume down on some of the symptoms. It's not going to treat the core issue. Yeah. Yeah. I, when I'm teaching psychopharmacology, I tell students it's a bit hyperbolic, but I say neglect is like battery acid to the brain. 
Yeah. Yeah. And the fiercer edges of neglect are, I, I think, truly that, where you have this horrible oversensitivity to cortisol. We have, you know, cortisol sensitization. You've heard of this one, right? Where, yeah. where the body, the, the job of cortisol as an anti-inflammatory substance, it no, no longer brings that anti-inflammatory action because the body is just constantly in a state of stress. And this can be intergenerational in nature where yeah. it, from the earliest age inside the womb, wh where we have a marginalized individual, for example, which are often, the, you know, and there's just like the, the cycle of neglect, right? Yeah. Where there's cortisol sensitization in the womb, the body doesn't have that anti-inflammatory action and that body is set up then for a neural circuitry that lacks the capacity for self-regulation. Yeah, I mean, and yeah. as we know, cortisol is actually really damaging to the brain. And yeah. what what we know about trauma and neglect, and I think people don't realize that, you know, child psychiatrists, we actually do three to four years of general psychiatry first, and then we do two years of child and adolescent. But so I see adults because I see what I'm doing, especially in an individual that has experienced trauma, is trying to figure out where are they developmentally, Right. Because this type of bathing and you know, cortisol your whole life really affects the way your brain can function. And it's not to say, I mean, I also believe in neuroplasticity, so it's not to say it can't be reversed. But I really try to figure out where people are, chronologically speaking, so I can, where can I meet that? But I, I also yeah, think it's and, like what yeah. you're saying, like our brains were not, our brains were really, I mean, they're kind of primitive. We were wired. Caveman days were famine or an animal. It's like you, you probably you're like reason for death, right? Or a war possibly with another tribe, right? Like those are, but they were transient stressors typically. Our brain and bodies are not wired for the chronic ongoing stress for year, year after year. Like you're saying, it was, neglect, which is like every day, all day. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, you have the radical neglect and then you have like the kind of common everyday human neglect that happens underneath this fantasy of the perfect childhood or the drama of the gifted yeah. child yes. where you have, you know, for, and it's like what the, one of the questions is like, what gets neglected? And, and a, a possible answer is, the emotions, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like where children get exposed to a window of joy or they get trapped in a window of joy, for example, where the, the parent finds it overstimulating if the, if the child expresses outside that window and yeah. then they, they neglect the, the further expanse of joy. And I think that cuts across all the major emotions, right? So I think it's a, it's an interesting answer to that question. Well, like what, what is it that's getting neglected developmentally? A lot, a big contender is the emotional system. Yeah. And again, this yeah. is just so yes. hard to quantify and it's not obvious yeah. to people. Like, I feel like even as a psychiatrist, I, like I kind of have to like sit and wait, plant yeah. seeds because there plant is a seeds. lot of resistance. We have heard more, right? Like Gabor yeah. talks about this authenticity versus attachment. And especially as children and humans, we are hardwired to attach and we will, you know, for, um, we won't be our authentic selves in order to attach. And so even, you know, the young adults I see who I can tell you within the first, you know, 15, 20 minutes of meeting them, I know like that this is what we're dealing with. It just takes time. It's very hard for people to see mm -hmm. or believe. One of the big... Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I get it. One of the big ones that I think it gets neglected is greed. I personally think that if war-torn countries could just get together and, and have a public grieving ritual, th that a lot of things would, would change. That like grief has, a, has this tremendous capacity to discharge. And a lot of men, of course, are just kind of really screwed up in terms of their relationship with grief. But I'm not just men. I think grief is a big one that the healing power of grief is very important and is very neglected. 
as a fundamental healing function, as a function of discharge, as a function of release. And people just hold that, right? We just hold that. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. So one of my mentors, she calls it apprenticing with grief. Of course, what's on the other side of grief tends to be love. And so it's exactly what you're saying. Mm. It's kind of the same, it's kind of the same coin that we're dealing with, but you do need to apprentice with it, process it, sit with it to get to that other side and see how com right, how common is it. But you're right. I think a lot of times too, when I look at, again, treatment resistant depression is once you get people to maybe see that this is what they're dealing with, then there's a, then there's a tremendous grief of the loss childhood right? like what could have been mm -hmm. but it's like you're talking about Alice mm -hmm. Smith, like no, Miller's book right the, was it the drama the grift the child right this is like this is a fantasy we had I think I can I guess only speak to the U.S. in some ways of this like childhood being this safe like I would have to tell you unfortunately it's a child psychiatrist that isn't the case I wish it was <laughs> yeah and it doesn't have to be a bad thing yeah. like how how do we get how how do we take these lessons and things get to the other side of them where the growth and expansion is? You and your family and your daughter are a living expression of the importance of early intervention. But if a, you know, if a person didn't get that, how could psychedelics support a developmental need that was neglected? And maybe a way into that is for you to Tell us a little bit about your clinical interest in psychedelics and how it might address developmental trauma. Yes. So I want to start off by saying, so I'm going to back up a little. There is a place for antidepressants. So I think, Brian, as we were talking earlier, you know, people come to me, they're like, oh, you're an integrated psychiatrist, a holistic psychiatrist, you don't believe in medicine. And that's not entirely accurate. I believe medicine has a place. I think if you're going to get fired from your job because your grief or your depression or your bipolar, whatever it is, is so, um, you know, the symptoms aren't managed. I think medicine is appropriate. Like, actually, you should be out of medicine and uh, it's needed, right? Like, had I not been on antidepressants in medical school, that wouldn't have been the appropriate time to start, like, working on my trauma. Probably wouldn't have finished. And so there's a place for everything, but what really piqued my interest, again, at this point, antidepressants are off the table. I'm in full-blown, you know, complex PTSD. I'm in therapy. I'm doing Gabor's course. And so the, when the first time, the first, uh, first psychedelic I did, because I looked at all the research and I felt like ayahuasca would be the best one for me, it was the first one that I tried. And what was... Unbelievable to me is, first of all, again, as a trauma psychiatrist, I couldn't believe I'd never tried any of these. And what I've now come to find is very cliche in the field that besides I had taken the medicine for three nights in a row, to me, it felt like five years of intense trauma work had happened. And some of the gifts of the psychedelic and around it, ones like ayahuasca, psilocybin are thousands of years. These are old medicines and they really don't have an addiction issue. Frankly, most of them don't have any issue with addiction. Ketamine, as we unfortunately know, can if it's used improperly, but the other ones don't. It's, it's, you really can't get addicted to them from a neuroscience, neuroscience level. But the gift of the psychedelic is to actually amplify the trauma, the traumas, or whatever. Uh, and this is uncomfortable, right? This is where it isn't always for everyone, and you have to be resourced enough to do it, or like me, desperate enough to do it. And so it brings, you know, brings the, the trauma or the issues, the feelings, whatever, to the surface, but with the idea that you're able to metabolize and process what occurred. And again, this can be very again, uncomfortable. Be very... But the importance of this too is oftentimes with whether it's neglect, 
past, you know, other types of trauma. You were alone with the trauma. This trauma is not witnessed. I mean, what we know from research is often it's not even the horrible event that's happened to somebody. It is how validated do they get on about the event. I've seen, unfortunately, I mean, I've worked in underserved areas actually most of my life prior to coming to private practice. And the biggest trauma I see is when a kid finally gets the nerve to talk about the abuse and every adult in the room talks about why it didn't happen. And it's mind blowing. Mm. That, that not validating and believing abuse is a thousand times more traumatic. And this is, a, this is again, this is what my patients are telling me, right? That is a thousand times more traumatic than what actually happened to them. So much of the psychedelic so allows so there to be some kind of like a witness to what's happened. So it amplifies so the trauma. It, amplifies it. it allows you to metabolize and process it. And then it helps you get to the other side, right? And on the other side can be growth, expansion, insight. And sometimes the trauma is actually just brought up as feelings. And even mm-hmm. processing or metabolizing feelings that were, whether it's like loneliness or extreme grief or helping. So no matter how difficult of a night I've had, usually on the other side, I'm like, oh my God, it feels so much better now. Yeah. yeah. And so... I think it does it, the psychedelics do it in a much more effective and efficient way. Because in the West, unfortunately, we have this concept, and I shouldn't say this is not entirely true, but we have a concept that the trauma is in our head, right? Like everything is in our head. And initially I was trained in trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, which I still think there's a place for that. But we now know, and what ancient traditions like the Shipibo tradition is that trauma actually is a shattering of the soul. And oftentimes the soul can depart because it's so shocking. So it's something that affects the mind, body, and soul. They actually talk about Shipibo tradition, talks about it blocks all our senses and it blocks our external and internal experiences. And I think that's what, you know, in the West, we talk about almost like the developmental growth stops happening. Mm. Um, And Mm. so their idea of what these medicines do is, again, is help to process it and actually help bring the soul back, creating the conditions in your psyche, in your body, you know, to bring the soul back to its home. Because sometimes it just gets so distressed by what's happened. And that's why you see people, right? I mean, you used to call it shell shock, right? Like people don't necessarily, people aren't necessarily their best selves, right? When they're experiencing what actually just yesterday somebody called, which I agree is called post-traumatic stress syndrome. It's not a disorder. It's actually a very normal response to really abnormal things happening to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it's interesting how in Western lingo you have the cosmos in the in the clinic if you want to call it that in the ancient traditions but in the western laboratory language you have dissociation as yes you know like this yes. this this clinical term and there's this thing that happens where the escape hatch is taken or the the button for the ejection seat happens when something horrible happens you have dissociation but you know, there's something soul crunching about it that the word dissociation doesn't quite get at, you know? And it's, it's again, pathologizing. I think dissociating is actually a really healthy thing. I mean, yeah, some of the kids sure. I've seen with like, you know, severe abuse, they talk about this association, but what an amazing thing our body does is have to be checked out versus be present with what's happening. So psychedelics, I mean, the other way they help us process, they help us to, again, be present with what occurred. So again, we can process it. And what we do do know from even Western models of therapy, one of the underlying things that seems to help, and Edna Foe talks about this, is this actual exposure. I think what we're missing is we don't always have to talk about 
the trauma. And psychedelics also helps you do this without the talking. And what we know from fMRI studies is that when you have somebody being scanned and somebody talks about their trauma, their Broca's area, their area of speech is actually understimulated or completely shut down. And this makes sense, but nobody wants to talk about what happens. And we now know that physiologically, they probably really can't. And so some of the kind of newer modalities, like I think somatic experiencing, right, which really focuses on like, where in your body are you feeling this? What emotions are there? What is your body trying to tell you? I think internal family systems to a large effect too can be very helpful in understanding why your body does what it does. So instead of, again, pathologizing, right, saying, oh, dissociation is bad. What is your body trying to do? What is your, what is your body's trying to keep you safe? It's just desperately trying to keep you safe. Have you ever run into Nancy McWilliams, psychoanalytic diagnosis? She's lovely. She has this great way. She's got a non-pathologizing attitude towards dissociation as well. And she says, you know, a person that dissociates because of a horrible thing that happened, what they actually do is they create a world. It's, it's a creative response to a horrible situation. And they become, in a way, in a strange sort of way, they become a, a creator of worlds. Because you, you have to kind of create a world to be safe in when you're not really safe. And so in a weird sort of way, there's a natural kind of shamanistic inclination towards somebody that's been traumatized and shattered because they've already started the process of creating worlds that are safe. It's really, you know, Lindsay Gibson talks about that. So she wrote, you know, she's written a series, The Adult Children of Emotionally Mature Parents. And she basically, she calls them healing fantasies, right? And it's exactly mm -hmm. what you're talking about. So it's like alternate worlds where like you can be safe or you can actually play out roles that may be validating to you. That can become a point where it isn't so helpful. Similar to the dissociation, right? Like dissociation yeah. becomes not very helpful. Well, in my work with trauma resolution, you know, I emphasize the literature, PTSD literature, about how it's actually safer to start with a third person perspective, neur neurologically speaking, you know, to approach the trauma from a third person outside the body perspective. You know, P that's one of the errors in somatics is that there can be this assumption that the body is like a safe place to be. It's a bad assumption. Yeah. It's a bad <laughs> assumption. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. it's like, you know, the, the irony in somatics is with really traumatized bodies, we need to start from the outside. We need to start from more of a third person perspective. And that clocks with the trauma literature saying that people, you know, that are doing trauma processing and when people try, you know, dissociate and stuff like that, it, it's always safer and less of the kind of reptile regions of the brain light up when that person is in third person perspective. Yeah, you you just reminded me, I know, of course, I'm going to forget who said this, but they talk about that with somebody who's experiencing, you know, post-traumatic symptoms, post-traumatic stress symptoms. Your body is the battlefield. Like, you are not escaping what's like, and it is constant. And so, yeah, exactly what you're saying. The body is not a safe place to be, and there is no escaping them. So no wonder people dissociate or create healing fantasies, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And that's why it's so important. And you, you know this as an adolescent and child psychiatrist that imagination is a tremendous resource. And, and you know, instead of going into the body and going into the con concrete what happened, no, let's go to the realm of the imagination, the realm of the imagination. So, you, you know, that we can find the the dissociated self, the fragmented self, because it's hanging out there, you know, it found a safe place. And, and so I use the imagination a lot clinically, right? Because the imagination symbolism, dream symbology, because it's a, I call it the halfway house between, you know, the other world and the body. Yeah. And the imagination is kind of the halfway house for that. And we need to meet people in that space. Yeah. You know, you're actually reminding me that I mean, the very first journey I had, the first thing she, you know, ayahuasca is referred to as she, did was to show me some of my trauma, but as a witness, 
like I was, yeah. you know, hovering above and gave also gave me kind of an ob, kind of an ob, objective perspective, like, yeah, that kind of sucked. But like, unfortunately, like your experience is kind of, it happens. It happens to people, yeah. Yeah. right? Get, mm-hmm. And it's exactly what you're saying, like kind of getting outside and being able to have some perspective and not be with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or so, so attached this, to it, right? Like yeah. so attached to our suffering. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And from a developmental perspective, it's like you have this developmental arrest because yes. there's been a neglect or there's been an abuse. And, and I think psychedelics can have a way of getting things moving, you know, just getting things moving, getting the, the serotonin fluctuating on a molecular level, you know, and the other neuromodulators, cause it's not just serotonin, right. But just to get uh, often the image is used of a snow globe, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Just like, Hey, let's get the molecules going because there's the, there, there's some Freud called it a cathexis, which actually isn't a bad term. It's really just like a kind of knotting in, in the neural apparatus and in the brain and stuff like that, where mm-hmm. you have a some sort of arrest or a blockage is something stuck in there, you know? And I think that's an interesting way to frame it, right? Is the snow globe effect. Thank you for listening to The Boundless Body with The Somatic Doctor. Please leave a comment, subscribe, and like us on social media. We're a swarm, we're a colony, we're a multiplicity. Until next time. Be well.